Uh, it's looking good. We'll see if it looks good. All right, guys. So as you know, you didn't, you did not have a daily problem due. Um, yeah, I know, but awesome. But the unfortunate part is, is you will have two due Friday. Yes. But they are easy, and you should be able to do them fairly, fairly simple. So uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to uh, finish talking about intermolecular attraction forces. We're going to discuss the consequences that has for things like boiling points. Uh, then we're going to start talking about solids. And this is probably the only time in your chemistry career where you're going to talk about solids. But, so we better do it right. Um, and then uh, we'll start talking about some of the consequences uh, the electronic states of solids have for making things like conductors and semiconductors and insulators. Um, so last time we finished up talking about dispersion forces. Dispersion. And could someone give me kind of an accurate representation of what dispersion forces were? Short, sweet, kind of to the point. Maybe a, what's that? Does it lose energy before they like push together? That's not quite the, what the dispersion interaction is, but yeah, the, it gets lower in energy at a certain point. What causes that attraction, though? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess in a way it does. Um, yeah. So, you were, can you elaborate more on your your electromagnetism? <laughs> He said dipole moments, uh, you know, positives and negatives, you know, magnetic fields interacting. It's, you know, one side's always stronger, one side's weaker. Because it's all the right. What, are, what were you going to say, Kyle? I was going to say that as two um, atoms are pressed together, the electrons, like the electron cloud, interact with the, um, the, the negative charge of the electrons interact with the positive charge of the atom that the way it causes the. It's, it's not quite because of that interaction. It's more about the polarizability of the electron density itself. So a little shift away. You, you are right where you're saying that the positive charge on the nucleus is attracting them a little bit and that negative charge is repelling. But it has to also deal with that electron density moving a little bit. So we call uh, that movement of the electron density, what do we call that? Start with a P. Yep. Polarizability. So we'd get these two, we'd squish these two uh, spherical electron density distributions together, and then what would happen is, actually let's just send it this way. Um, if we're sending it this way, we know what's going to happen. We end up getting <coughs> this situation where if we push it that way, You've got to get a slight positive on this side, a slight negative on that side, because there's a greater buildup of electron density. Squishing those, it's going to push the other one in kind of this cloud formation where we get a partial positive and a partial negative. And there's a slight attraction between these partial charges that's there. Um, now, what can you say about the strength of this dispersion interaction? Would you consider it strong or would you consider it weak? Weak. Weak! <laughs> yeah. Weak interaction. Okay. And we determined that all last time. Um, now, um, in general though, uh, the, bigger, the bigger the molecule, what do you think about the dispersion forces? Are you going to have a greater amount of dispersion forces or a less amount of dispersion forces? Greater. Why? Yeah, there's more electrons. So there's more electron density, which means you can move that around more. It's more polarizable. You can squish it more. So the bigger the atom or the bigger the molecule, typically the more dispersion interactions that you can have. So in general, the larger the molecule, oops, the more Dispersion forces. Okay. So the bigger, squishier cotton candy you have, the more easy it is to move it around. Um, now, we said that these were the weakest. 
we should probably rank the interaction of these intermolecular attraction forces. That way we can have a better idea of assessing which one's going to have a higher boiling point and which one's going to have a lower boiling point. Because that can be quite useful information. So let's talk about the strength. That's a good marker. Higher. <laughs> Molecular attraction forces. Okay. So we'll have the strongest and we'll have the weakest. So someone toss, toss some names of intermolecular attraction forces that we talked about last time. H bonds. All right, give me another one. Dispersion. All right, <laughs> that was easy. We just talked about it. What's, uh, what's another one? Well, it's another one. We have H bonds, dispersion forces. Give me something else. Sigma bond. What's that? Sigma bonds. Those are more of a covalent in intramolecular interaction. So that happens inside of the molecule. What about outside of the molecule with adjacent ones? We talked dipole, dipole. dipole. Yep, we got dipole, dipole. All right, and we, and we have ion dipole too. Um, so let's look at these. Let's consider which one. We already said which one's the weakest. Which one was the weakest? Yeah, van der Waals or dispersion. So dispersion. is the weakest. What's, a, what's stronger? Or what comes next in the series? Uh, well, it's debatable. I would say no. Oh, yeah, you have two more choices. Dipole. Yep, dipole, dipole. Typically, dipole, dipole. Is, a, is stronger than dispersion. It's greatly stronger than dispersion. Um, but now if you, so what do you think comes next? Ion, the uh, It's hydrogen. Yep, H bonds. Then the last one, ion dipole. Now, um, I said this is debatable because the strength of these completely depends on whatever situation you're looking at. But if you're looking at the maximum possible energy you can gain from looking at each of these, um, this will be the lowest in energy, or it has the ability to be the lowest in energy, followed by hydrogen bonds, followed by dipole-dipole interactions, followed by dispersion. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is, is these guys are significantly stronger than dispersion. Dispersion is incredibly weak. The rest of these guys, by classification, could be considered very strong. All right? Um, so let's talk about uh, boiling points and intermolecular attraction forces. So boiling points. And intermolecular forces. Okay, so we're going to be talking about boiling point. What is the boiling point? Or we'll say normal boiling point. <coughs> so what what is the boiling point? Tell me that. Point at which it turns into a gas. So from what? From a liquid. Yep, from a liquid. Liquid. So it's the temperature at which um, this phase transition between going from a liquid to a gas occurs. Now I added the qualifier normal. Does anybody know why I added that? Yeah? Because if you change the pressure or other variables, it could change the boiling point. Yep, exactly. As you change the pressure, the boiling point will actually change. If you uh, go to boil water at sea level, as opposed to climbing up to the top of Mount Everest, or one of the other taller mountains, the boiling point will actually be drastically different. Um, so, the normal boiling point is the temp 
where we have a phase transition from liquid to solid, or excuse me, liquid to gas, <laughs> liquid to gas at one ATM, <coughs> at one atmosphere of pressure. Okay? Um, so in general, we can say something about the intermolecular attraction forces in the boiling point. So you're going to finish the statement for me. Generally, as the amount of intermolecular forces increases, what would you assume happens to the boiling point? <laughs> Dan wanted to say it, but he pointed instead. Yep, it also increases. So um, the boiling point increases. And there is an assumption here that's assuming the molecular weight stays approximately <coughs> the same. Assuming molecular weight stays approximately the same between the molecules we're comparing, between the molecules we are comparing. We are comparing. Okay. Um, so now we know all about what each of these intermolecular attraction forces is. We know that the consequences it has on the boiling point. However, we really don't know how to assess what molecules have which intermolecular attraction forces yet, right? Um, we're going to use a little thought map to kind of go through um, and to use to figure out what intermolecular attraction forces a compound does have. So, am I okay to erase this side? All right. Uh, don't call before people say yes, that's okay. Alright, uh, so, uh, I thought I was going to sneeze. It's always the worst. Alright, um, so what two types of bonds did we talk about pretty much for the entirety of last semester? Yep, bionic. Okay. Yeah. There is metallic. We're not going to worry about metallic right now. They have a lot of weird um, intermolecular attraction forces. And we'll actually kind of discuss today is a solid um, one big compound, or isn't it? Um, but anyways. So we have ionic and covalent. How do we know if we have an ionic bond? In a metal and a non-metal. Yeah, metal and a non-metal. We'll assume that. A better definition would be um, a large difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. But metal and non-metal is going to suffice for this class. What about covalent compounds? Somebody other than Kyle. Non -metal. Yep, non-metal and non-metal. Okay, so that's pretty easy to assess, right? We can have two different types of covalent compounds. What are those two different types of covalent compounds? Polar yep, polar. And we can have nonpolar. How do we know if we have a polar compound again? For a polar compound, zero dipole moment? Yep, not, did I ask non-polar? Yeah. Oh, okay. Or did I ask polar? I asked polar? Okay, so non-polar compounds have no overall molecular dipole moment. 
where polar compounds do have an overall molecular dipole moment. Okay. Now, nonpolar compounds, since they they have no other interaction other than dispersion interactions, that's the only thing that they can have. So you can only have dispersion. <coughs> However, do polar compounds also have dispersion interactions? Yes, anything with electron density will have a dispersion interaction. So everything has a dispersion interaction. So polar compounds also have this. Okay. Uh, what type of intermolecular attraction force do polar compounds have that nonpolar compounds just plain old don't have? Yep, they have dipole dipole. Polar compounds have a dipole dipole. Interaction. Now compounds that can have um, a dipole dipole interaction can interact with ionic compounds, right? So there's going to be another connection here. What's going to go in this? Area. What intermolecular attraction force? Ion yep, ion dipole. Okay. What's the very last one that we haven't accounted for yet? Hydrogen. Yep, the H bonds or hydrogen bonds. So, if we have a dipole-dipole interaction, we might be able to have H bonds. If, what is, I'm adding a qualifier, if, what do we need to have H bonds? <coughs> we need to have the following bonds. Nitrogen, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. What else? Yep, oxygen-hydrogen bond. The very last one? Fluorine-hydrogen bond. We need to have those bonds present in order to have hydrogen bond. By the strict definition. So we have that little thought map here. And that's what I construct in my head every time I'm looking at um, a Lewis structure and I want to figure out if it, what intermolecular attraction forces something is. So let's see an example of that. We're going to um, determine the intermolecular attraction forces for three molecules. All right. So example. Determine Lewis structure and the intermolecular forces for the following. <coughs> A, we have NH3. What's the name of that compound? Ammonia. Good. B, C, H3, Cl. And C, we have ethane. Or, yeah, ethane. All right, anybody feeling brave? All right, we got one. I need two more people to come up front and draw the Lewis structures for me. Anybody feeling brave? B is really easy, so I would take that one as soon as possible. And then we have C, which is also pretty easy. Um, I've given you <coughs> the topology of the molecule. Come on, someone, you see, yes, no, you feel like you could do it? No, yeah, don't be afraid. I look like a jerk up front. Anyone else is probably looks better than me up here, so. I'll wait, who's gonna do it? 
Or am I going to have to pick? Yeah, go for it. Attaboy, Mitch. Or Mitchell. Which I forget, which one do you like more? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. All right, so let's assess. Are A and B correct? Yeah, they're good. Yeah, you automatically assumed your own work was incorrect. Man, you need to have more faith in yourself. That looks awesome. Thanks. <coughs> okay, let's go through um, and let's first figure out, do we have any ionic compounds up on the board? No, we have no ionic compounds. We're good. So we have a, a covalent compound. We have to figure out if they're polar or nonpolar now. Um, let's draw the... Uh, uh, dipole moments. Which, which one is more electronegative? Hydrogen or nitrogen? Yeah. Bam. 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 Is this compound polar or nonpolar? Polar. polar. It's a molecular dipole pointing that way. Let's draw for this guy. What's more electronegative? Hydrogen or carbon? Which one's more electronegative? Carbon. Carbon is, yep. Yeah. One that way, one that way, one that way. All right. What about between chlorine and carbon? Which one's more electronegative? Chlorine. Chlorine. Is there an overall dipole moment for this molecule? Yes. Yep, there is. Which way is it pointing? Up. Yep, it's pointing up yet again. Okay, let's draw it for uh, ethane. One that way, one that way, one that way. Polar or not polar? Yeah. Not sure. How many people say non-polar in the room? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That paid for yourself. All right. It's non-polar. No, no polar. Non-polar. Okay. No polar. okay. So that, that makes this easy. Because um, we know now all we have to do is, is look at this chart and figure out what we need to do. All right. What, what interaction do all of these guys have? Dispersion. If on an exam or ever asked, everything you ever see, always circle dispersion. Or... Uh, write down dispersion. So we have dispersion. 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 Okay. C is good. Since it's not polar, it can only have dispersion forces. What about A? <laughs> So we got dipole, dipole. Hydrogen bonds. Yep, and we have H bonds. <coughs> Are those the only ones that that guy has? Yep. Um, the really kind of strange thing about ammonia is, is if you take ammonia and you react it with either lithium or sodium, what you can actually do is produce a solvated electron. You have an electron 